Good morning. And we are back. Boker Tov. We are back to the usual Sunday classes after the Hebrew month of Tishrei with his Baruch Hashem, thank God, so many holidays. The holiday of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot and Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. So we didn't have our usual schedule, but we're back. Baruch Hashem, new year, new energy, new blessing, new commitment to be there for each other. I will not make a, a bracha, a blessing on the coffee because I already said a, a shahako blessing on something else that I had shortly before the class. But I will say l'chaim to life. And you could see, for those who have a keen eye, you might notice that I have my Avraham cup back. The first one I had broke. And uh, the kind individual who got me the cup uh, on his own, I did not ask, went ahead and got me another cup. So a big thank you to Steve. Thank you very, very much for the cup that allows me to share it. A blessing every single Sunday by making a shahakol on the coffee, on the wonderful coffee. So, yashakoch to Steve. Okay, let's get to it. And <clears throat> I want to, in this couple of weeks that we didn't have class, there were th things that we did that we studied and learned and we didn't have a chance to, to discuss. We finished the reading of the Torah, Simchas Torah, when we dance with such great joy with our kinalach and the family and community, etc. Et and we dance because we are so thankful and appreciative that we completed the Torah. On Simchas Torah, we read the last of the portions of the Torah. And on Simchas Torah, we begin the first, we begin the Torah anew, hopefully on a deeper and higher level, which is one of the reasons why the Torah ends with the words of Zot HaBracha. The last portion is, and this is the blessing. On a sort of uh, uh, homiletic, I guess, level is, once we have merited to finish and studying the entire Torah, Zot HaBracha, this is the greatest blessing that we can have, is that the fact that we finished and we went through the entire Torah. And interestingly enough, we start again, and it is Bereshis is how the Torah begins, which is with the letter Bet, as opposed to the letter Aleph, which is the first of the Hebrew letters. Amongst the reasons are because Bet is the same letter that the word Bracha, blessing, begins with. So here you see the connection between the last portion, the Zot HaBracha, this is the blessing, and the beginning of Torah, which is a Bet, which is Bereshit, which also represents blessing. Also, very in line, very apropos to ending and finishing and, and, and restarting the Torah, uh, completing the Torah and restarting the Torah, is the fact that, uh, uh, that it starts with a bet, which the question is asked in commentaries and so on, why it starts with a bet, which is the letter B or the second letter, as opposed to Aleph, is because it comes to tell us and teach us that no matter how much we study Torah, which is God's wisdom, there's always a deeper and higher level which we can study because it's God's wisdom and it's infinite. Know this, that whatever you study and as deep as you study, there's always deeper that you can go. And that's what the bet represents, telling you that there's a level above, there's a level that's higher, that's greater. So we finish studying the Torah and we start again, we're not just repeating that which we studied last year, but we are now entering, uh, now that we have completed the Torah and we have a deeper appreciation and uh, our mind is more in sync with Torah, now when we begin again, we start on a deeper level, not just a repeat from last year. So that is an introduction to some of what we are going to be studying today. Now, I want to connect also with regards to an insight. And I might have shared some of these insights in the past. It's kind of difficult to remember between all the different classes, what has been shared over here publicly on Facebook and YouTube versus uh, for the first time. But these are beautiful insights. And um, 
<clears throat> I don't go through my previous classes before I give this class Sunday morning as a as this is more a discussion uh, with friends. So um, please bear with me if you've already heard this before. Regardless, we read the parasha again, so it's good to hear these thoughts again. So first I want to go to the end of the Torah, of Zotah Bracha, and then we will go to Bracious. And I also want to share um, with you at some point what I believe is a fascinating personal story that's sort of in development. Um, I will try to only, I won't give all the details to the story just to protect the privacy of who this is occurring with. But since I think there's an inspirational message with this story, I will share it. Okay, we'll get to that. Now, L'chaim, L'chaim. The Torah's last portion, as mentioned, begins with the words of Zotah Bracha. I want to read first the verse in Hebrew, and then I will read this, the translation. Hebrew being the actual words that God spoke and gave us the Torah. V'zotah bracha sheberach Moshe isho elokim et b'nei Yisrael lifnei moto. Translation, and this is the blessing which Moses, a man of God, gave to the children of Israel shortly before his death. And it says like this, God came out from Sinai to meet the Jewish people and he shined his glory on them. After coming from Seir, where the children of Esau, this is explanation, why did he come from Seir? Because the children of Esau lived in Seir, and God went to them first, as the Medrash, the Rashi explains, he went first to ask the people of Seir whether they want to receive the Torah, and they declined. He then came to, from Mount Paran, where the children of Ishmael had declined to accept the Torah, and then he came to Sinai and asked the Jewish people whether you want to receive the Torah, and they said, Na'asev and Nishma, we will do, and we will study, and we will learn, and we will listen, and we will abide. Not abide, we will, yeah, I think so, yeah, is that the right word? We will, uh, we will listen, we will follow the instructions of Torah. <laughs> so, he first went to Seir, he went to the children of Esau. He then went to the children of Ishmael. He asked them whether they would receive the Torah, and they said no. And Medrash elaborates that he went to the children of Esau, and based on what the Torah says, that um, that Esau, it says, that you would live on the sword, God asked Esau whether they, he, they would receive the Torah. And... They ask God, what does it say in the Torah, the Ten Commandments? And they, uh, God said to them, it says, Lo tirzach, you shall not murder. And they said, sorry, we cannot accept this Torah that doesn't allow us to murder. This is our profession. This is what we do. We survive on the sword. He then came to Yishmael and he asked Yishmael, what should you? What should we? Uh, you know, receive the Torah. And Yishmael says, "What does it say in the Torah?" God says, "It says in the Torah that you shall not commit adultery." And Yishmael said, "You should not covet your friend's wife." Again, one of the Ten Commandments. And Yishmael said, "We cannot receive a Torah of that with those kind of restrictions and limitations." <clears throat> You know, interesting, we find also by the flood, which we are about to read, and this coming week, is that with the flood also, part of the, the, when the Torah describes the sin of the generation of the flood, and why God brought the flood, we find again these two things, we find actually, uh, you know, we find uh, murder, we find theft actually, uh, and we find um, forbidden relations is what sort of closed the deal, killed the deal, in terms, close the deal in terms of the decree that God should bring the flood. So here, there is a deeper question that needs to be thought and a very beautiful explanation given by the Rebbe. Both, both thoughts that I'm going to share today are insights from the Rebbe, and some of it is a bit my sort of elaboration. Um, <clears throat> so God will goes to Ishmael, he goes to Esau, and he says, would you like to receive the Torah? Let's get rid of this. It's giving us a little bit of a glare. Would you like to receive the Torah? 
They say, no, God comes to the Jewish people. What is the deeper significance here? What's the deeper significance? Was God playing a game? Did he think that the Torah was actually to be given to Esau, to Ishmael? Did he not know? Does God not know that they would say no? Why does he have to go to them before he goes to the Jewish people? I mean, these are like obvious questions. And one of the explanations given is a very beautiful explanation, again, given by the Rebbe, which is, of course, God knows in advance what Yishmael would respond, what Esau would respond. The objective of God going to Esau and to Ishmael is the following. The ultimate um, goal, so to speak, the ultimate desire of God in creating the world is a world where goodness and holiness and godliness is so uh, clear, there's no confusion, there's no obscurity, so that all act accordingly in a way that is, that is refined, in a way that is proper, in a way that is, that is uh, sensitive to good, in a way that rejects that which is wrong, a way that, in a way that uh, kindness is, 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 is clear and no one is out there harming others and so on. You know, how many times do we see violence or senseless uh, hate and we say, you know, why? Why is this? How could a human being come to a point that they commit those kinds of acts? But that's not the objective. Why God created evil in the first place or the potential for evil is a discussion. And, uh, you know, perhaps we will address that. But here we do address it somewhat that <clears throat> the ultimate purpose is for us to overcome those perhaps tendencies and drives and leanings to what we would call in the terms of the sort of Talmud, the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, and to make the right choices. The more we are in tune and connected to holiness and godliness, the more we will be able to make those right decisions and live accordingly. Now, when God goes to Yishmael and he goes to Esau, which, and, he, and which, representing really all the nations of uh, the world at the time, and symbolically all of time, Essentially, what was happening is that was part of the process of God achieving um, or laying the groundwork to achieve the above mentioned objective. And I titled this class, you know, Challenging the Umpire's Decision. You know, the R knows, the R knows, N O, know that are the beginning of a yes. You know, when a, when a teenager, for example, like really nags you about something that you have uh, uh, denied them, you've told them no, often the challenge that the teenage, teenager will challenge you creates a, a sort of an environment or, or, or a, or a um, response or future response which will be a yes your very no is the beginning of a yes and i use the analogy since i'm a brooklyn boy if you're from brooklyn give us a thumbs up and i grew up sort of watching baseball baseball was the dominant sport in new york perhaps it still is i don't really have the time other than i hear from my kids sometimes but i don't really you know, watch sports or follow sports. But I grew up with baseball. And uh, now I know is the, uh, is the uh, <coughs> off season, not off season, now is the uh, playoffs. <laughs> I know, you know, when I was, a, when I was in, my, in my youth, playoffs meant there was, um, you know, one series of playoffs and then there was the World Series. Now, uh, you know, there's all these different levels, I guess, I guess, in my view, perhaps again, I don't follow it and understand, you know, closely, but you know, we want to make everybody feel good, so we give every single team uh, a chance, even after they've lost the season. So that's that's a, a a sports discussion. You're welcome to give me in your comments your insights on that for the for the baseball uh, for the baseball mavens. But 
but I do remember, and once in a while when I watch, if I watch a game or part of a game, is that if an umpire makes a bad call in the player's or manager's perception, um, they go out and they strongly challenge the call. Now, I do not remember ever uh, that an umpire changed his mind, that he made a call and the manager or the player objected and he changed his mind. I don't remember that ever that happening. I think today now they have a uh, replay, an instant replay and so on. But again, as a, as a youngster, that didn't exist. Umpire made a call, end of story, right? Nevertheless, nevertheless, the calls were challenged. Why were the calls challenged? So as I remember, the explanation is that that was, a, was increased your chances that the next controversial or questionable call will go your way. And that's why you challenge. In other words, although the umpire is saying no, it is, you can turn that no into the beginning of a yes by challenging the empire's decision. So here too, the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu, why God Almighty went to Ishmael and Esau and he said to them that, uh, would you like to receive the Torah is because the objective of Torah, which is to bring holiness and goodness to the entire world, is something that is for all, is for all. And the fact that they said no, although they said no, but the very fact that God asked them, the creator of heavens, heaven and earth, nothing that God does, does goes to waste. Nothing that God does doesn't ultimately come to fruition. And therefore their very no was a temporary no. And as the prophets tell us that when Mashiach comes, the entire world will be one big yes to God's plan and God's desire. So therefore God goes to the nations, Esau and Yishmael, symbolic of the nations of the world at the time, which although at that time they did not say a resounding yes, it was the beginning of a yes. And this is an amazing insight into uh, understanding the truth, the inner truth of this world and its goal and um, and where it will, it will uh, eventually uh, come to, despite the darkness that we might see around us. I want to elaborate on that point by connecting this to another Torah insight uh, <clears throat> that I sent out uh, before Shabbat, our weekly Shabbat sort of meme, but I want to elaborate on that and connect this to what we just said as I will proceed after this L'chaim. L'chaim. So, <clears throat> from, from the end of Devarim, we go to the beginning. As we end, we go straight to the beginning, as mentioned. And in the beginning of the Torah, the Torah begins, again, with the holy words of Hashem. Let's begin the words of Torah together. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim v'et haaretz. In the beginning of God's creation of the heaven and the earth, there was, when the earth was astoundingly desolate, darkness was on the surface of the deep waters that covered the land and the throne of God's glory hovered over the water. Okay? God said, what was the first thing God said? God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the times of light from the times of darkness and God called the God called out the light and assigned it to day and he called out the darkness and assigned it to the night. I'm reading the translation also based on some elaboration inserted in this particular translation. So the first thing God creates is God says let there be light. That's the first thing Hashem creates. Now why is it that the first thing Hashem creates is light, says the Rebbe, the following beautiful insight. And again, this is connected with the insight we just uh, shared on the end of the Torah. God said, let there be light. God, you know, an architect, an architect when uh, designing a building, a project, always will first think about what is the 
goal? What is the objective of this building, of this project that we are about to build? Once I know the objective, then I can start going to the details. So by, by first saying, Vayomer lekim mihi or let there be light, God is setting the tone and he's saying that the objective of creation, the goal of all of creation is that there should be light. <clears throat> We use the expression, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Who says there's light at the end of the tunnel? Maybe the objective is to just remain in darkness within the tunnel. Can you tell me that that's not the case? The answer is you will tell me that's not the case because we have a deep-seated sort of subconscious and conscious belief that there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's just, and, and, if, and if we don't see the light or we don't feel the light, we're very disturbed, we're very agitated, we're very troubled, we, we, we object to it. It's just the way it is. But why? Perhaps you're supposed to remain in the tunnel, in a, in a place of darkness, whether it's on a cosmic level, whether it's on a uh, society level, whether it's on a uh, personal level, when darkness and all that it represents, life's challenges, spiritual darkness, mental darkness, perhaps you're supposed to remain in a place of darkness. Who says there's light at the end of the tunnel? But no, we believe deeply there's light at the end of the tunnel. And not only do we believe it, we act accordingly. That's why we have hope that things will get better. That's what keeps us going. And the answer is yes, you are right. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Because the objective, God immediately upon creation says, Vayomer Elohim, and God said, Yehi Or. My purpose of all of creation, again, on a cosmic, on a global level, on an individual level, is the light that will come and will certainly come. As said before, if God wants it, if God comes over and asks you, even if the world sort of says no, so eventually that already softens the situation. And eventually it will come to fruition. There will be a yes. By Yomer Elohim and God said, let there be light. So <clears throat> on a personal level, when you find yourself in a challenging position, you need to know the very knowledge of that brings comfort and gives you motivation. Yes, the objective of this, God would not put me into a situation unless the light that it will bring. Sometimes we merit to see the light sooner. Sometimes we merit to see it later. Sometimes you don't even merit to see it, unfortunately, or, or sadly, or, and that might be part of the plan. But most of the time, if we have this knowledge, we will come to see the light that comes out of the challenge, out of the darkness. Again, whether it's on a societal level, whether it's on a personal level, which is, again, why ultimately, the prophets tell us the world will come on a more general level. There will be the light. All of the world will have that spiritual, holy awareness that will come as the prophets again and again foretell. <clears throat> now, I want to add an additional thought in how one can attain and achieve this light. So the Medrash says the following, when it says, Vayavdil Elohim, and God separated the or, God separated the, the, uh, <coughs> the light. So <coughs> Rashi says, excuse me, Rashi says that, <coughs> that the light that how, what does it mean God separated the light? So the simple meaning is, as we read, he separated from darkness and there was night, there was day. But Rashi gives us from the Medrash that God saw that this particular light that was created on the first day was too good, was too powerful, too overwhelming. Man wasn't ready for it yet. And he hid the light. Where did he hide the light into? He hid the light, says Rashi, la tid lavo, for the world to come. That's where he hid the light, says Rashi. The Medrash, where Rashi gets this insight from, also comments and says, where did Hashem hide this light? Listen to this, because this is the, uh, the key of how we could attain and access this light. 
God says, the, the Medrash says, that where did he hide this light? Gonzo Batorah, he hid the light in the Torah. When you sit down and you study Torah, and you fulfill what the Torah wants, you can access this tremendous light, which is one of the reasons it is explained why tzaddikim, righteous men, can have and see things that men of lower spiritual status cannot because their study of Torah and through Torah and the depth of Torah that gives them the uh, that gives them access, that gives them, that reveals to them this greater light. And this greater light is what allows them to see things, see, see, see things that we don't see. But even on a simpler level, on a less sort of complicated level, the greatest gift that God has given us is this light of Torah. When you study Torah, when you learn Torah, which is so accessible today, and so sort of apropos proper now as we begin the parsha again that we commit five minutes, 10 minutes a day to learning and there are so many various levels that you learn, you access this tremendous light which was already there at the beginning of creation. And there's no question that this light of Torah will give you a whole new perspective and allow you to turn the darkness around you which unfortunately today there's so much darkness around there's also a lot of good there really is a lot of good there's probably a lot more good than the other way around although we hear and we see and it's you know have the media and social media you always it tend to see more of the darkness there's a lot of good every single day every single moment there's so much good that is being done but there's also darkness out there and by access by accessing this great light of torah you then go ahead and you begin that process, or not begin, you continue that process, which was started at creation, to, to you know, a little light to spell so much darkness. That is the merit and the gift that we have that we could achieve this through Torah. I want to I wanna share a story highlighting this point, as I said in the beginning of the class. And this is a, a personal story. I will not say names. I hope the person doesn't mind that I'm saying this story. I'm saying it because I believe it, it can inspire and highlight this important point. Um, you know, <clears throat> I, I did struggle a little bit what to share as learning this Parsha because there's so many important themes in the Parsha, whether it's the sin of the forbidden fruit, whether it is the first mitzvah the Torah gives us, the first commandment the Torah gives us, talking about the Torah being light. The first commandment the Torah gives us is to be fruitful and to multiply our responsibility to bring beautiful kinderlach, to, to bring beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful children, boys and girls into this world. Each one of them being a light, especially when educated properly through the morals and values that God gave us. So there's so many wonderful things to share of this week's Parsha, but we could only share uh, one or two thoughts, which is what we're doing. But I wanted to mention that because that also is being challenged. The value, this darkness being uh, sheared out there, which unfortunately is preventing uh, people from the greatest blessing, which is to have children, you know, the, the, the average of American households with children has gone down tragically because there's no greater blessing and there's no greater responsibility as this is the first mitzvah in the Torah. But we'll move on from that, get back to our subject, which is a story that, so last week on Sunday, Sunday last week was still part of the Sukkot holiday. It was actually a Shina rabbi. And I was asked as a local rabbi here in Coral Springs, uh, <clears throat> there was a, uh, you know, Governor DeSantis was in Coral, Coral Springs. So I was asked to do the invocation um, at this event and talk about spreading light anytime a, a I'm reached out on, whether on a city level or uh, on a uh, state level. Um, if I'm asked to spread, to do a blessing, to spread some Torah thought or whatever it is, 
My answer, if possible, is yes, regardless of political party. That is my responsibility to spread light. Um, so <clears throat> at this event, I spoke. I thank the governor for his unwavering support uh, of, of Israel um, and other uh, steps that I believe was beneficial to the Jewish community and beyond, but primarily my role there as thanking and showing hakarat tov, showing appreciation for uh, things that were done to the, I guess, religious community by and large and to the Jewish community in particular and Israel. And then I ended off with the words of Birchat Kohanim, the blessing of the Kohanim. I said it in Hebrew, the priestly blessing, being that I'm a Kohen, and uh, which means I'm a descendant of Aharon, the high priest, and Moses' brother. And any opportunity, whenever I'm asked to give a blessing, Birchat Kohanim, I... Uh, I do so with 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 honor because if I could bless somebody else, anybody who could bless someone else, the answer should always be yes. So I said the Birchat Konim, the Hebrew words, and then I translated. And the following, uh, right after the Chag, right after the holiday, I get a call, a text. I will not say names again for privacy. Um, <clears throat> that someone who was at the event recorded the recorded my words, but more in particular, the Birchat Kohanim, which was in Hebrew, and they, their, their family member, which, um, which sadly is um, basically on their deathbed, um, the Birchat Kohanim, the blessings of the Kohanim was recorded, they were at the event, and then they played it for this family member who was uh, in hospice and in their last days or hours. I never met this person before. I never spoke to this person before, but they reached out to me and they said that when they played this, the Birchat Kohanim for their relative, the relative who is basically non-responsive responded and, and, and showed, showed some acknowledgement and they were like amazed by it. And therefore they asked me whether I could come say some of the final prayers with this with this individual, which I did. Uh, and the story is still developing for other reasons and God willing, all will end up in the proper way. And uh, we don't stop praying for miracles. Who knows? Maybe a recovery uh, will take place. I've seen that as well, where I've said prayers for someone who was already uh, written off and they recovered. So we never stop praying. We prepare on the one hand, but we don't stop praying on the other hand. Um, <clears throat> and to me, the lessons learned from this story is, or, or two lessons. One lesson is that this divine providence that I'm humbled, that although I thought um, that there was only sort of one purpose over here, which is to share my blessings to the crowd as a rabbi, you know, in vocation, um, I was being at that moment a conduit by Hashem, by God Almighty, to... Uh, to help a, uh, a, a, a person return their soul in peace and properly according to Jewish tradition and so on, which is a, an amazing, uh, just for that, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. One person, one individual to properly return their soul when the time comes to, the crea to their creator, that in itself is worth it. But in addition, it was the power of Torah and the light of Torah. It is not my words and my... Uh, eloquent or uh, non-eloquent uh, speech or so on. It was specifically the Hebrew words of the blessing of the Kohanim. Talk about the light that God went ahead and put into the Torah that had this impact and brought about this amazing result. Um, in this case, uh, in a somewhat sad but important uh, uh, situation, but the lesson is in our life in general, the power and the light and the words of the Torah, not only in that which we could understand, that which stimulates sort of our intellect, but even beyond, it, there is a light, there's a power, there's a holiness to the very words of the Torah that is part of that initial first creation all of creation and all its details and all its happenings throughout history from the first moment is all 
was all preceded by that by Yomer Lakim and God said, Yehi or let there be light. And that powerful light was placed in Torah and it will be revealed to us, as Rashi says, in the world to come. And what I believe that means also on a deeper level is that through Torah, we can have a perspective which will be present in the so-called messianic world to come, which the prophets talk about. Torah lifts and gives you a perspective of holiness, of goodness, of what's important in life. It just lifts you and puts you in a whole different place because there's that powerful light that God laid the foundation and objective of all of creation. And one of the places he put it is in Torah. <clears throat> so as again, to sum it up, any action that God does must have a positive result. That is taught by us by the fact that he went to Ishmael and Esau. And even though he got a no, and he knew he would get a no, that it was begin that was the beginning of a yes, because that's the true core uh, reality of all of us of creation, which is why God starts the Torah with Yehi Or. We need to know this, especially in a time where we are challenged, where we might find ourselves in a place of darkness, whether it's materially, whether it's physically, sp spiritually, emotionally. Um, we have to know Yehi Or is the objective, and it's God's objective. It's the basis and the bedrock and the goal of creation. We will get there sooner or later. It is our job to make that sooner, both for our own betterment, our own positive attitude, which allows us to minimize the challenge that we might be going through, and even maybe more so, it allows us to do so with, with vigor, with energy, with positivity. And it will also hasten and bring about the ultimate objective that all this becomes in a very revealed, palpable way that we all, all of mankind, all of creation, lives in a way where this light shines forth from all of us um, in, a, in a world which will uh, actualize and reflect the objective of creation from the very first moment. Thank you for listening. Thank you for hopefully sharing these words of Torah so that you bring light onto today's mediums of social media or any other way. Uh, thank you very, very much. Have a great and successful week.